welcome to the Doofcast, a film and TV podcast from Doof Media. I am your host, Scott Daly, and I'm joined, as always, by Monsieur Freeman. How's it going today, Matt? I'm just trying to figure out this chair. <laughs> you just kind of push it a little bit, and that's a, a selling point, that if you push the top of it, it collapses? Yeah, everybody's really, really impressed with <laughs> the chair. <laughs> This week on the show, our series called Blind Spots continues as we go through the our 10 selected films from the BFI Sight and Sound 2022 critics poll of the top 100 films of all time. Obviously, these are the 10 films we haven't seen, hence the name Blind Spots. This week, we are on my third pick, which is the 1967 farcical comedy film titled Playtime. So we're going to be talking all about this wonderful, weird complex film that's right and then um matt i have to eat crow on a, a couple things so uh I, I wanted to talk to you briefly about the the television show uh called star wars colon ahsoka um so i had to talk to you about that show a little bit and then i also i watched uh if you heard of this a new new completely original live action uh netflix show called one piece yeah i heard that it's a new live action um tv show with yeah. no prior ip whatsoever exactly exactly so i i saw the first two episodes of that and i thought it'd be fun to talk to you about what that show is really really quick here at the end of the show sounds good all right uh but first let's talk all about playtime matt what is this movie about monsieur hulot curiously wanders around a high-tech paris paralleling a trip with a group of american tourists Meanwhile, a nightclub slash restaurant prepares its opening night, but it's still under construction. I feel sympathy for the person that had to write the IMDb summary for this movie because I don't know I don't know where I would be begin either. So I, I don't know if I like that uh, as an explanation of what this film is, but it certainly captures what happens in the movie. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Uh, this film was written by Art Buckwald, Jacques Lagrange, and Jacques Tati. It was directed by the the famous, although not to us, Jacques Tati. Um, Matt, I picked this movie for a few reasons, but the primary reason I picked this movie, interestingly enough, was because there is a YouTuber that I watch frequently called Video Game Donkey. He is a comedy video game YouTuber, one of the biggest video game YouTubers on the platform. Uh, he's very funny. He's good to watch. If you like video games, you should watch his stuff. Well, randomly last year, I think maybe the year before, he released a video about this movie that I I hadn't heard of at the time called Playtime. And it's it's a video where he's basically talking about why he loves this movie so much. And I listened to this video with curiosity going like, huh, interesting. OK. And uh, and he really sold it. And I, I put it on my list. I need to watch this movie. And then while we were we were doing this uh this this segment uh i saw it this movie was on the list it's the 23rd greatest film of all time according to this list actually and i said oh man this is my excuse i gotta watch this movie so that's that's why we're talking about this movie now matt because of video game donkey <laughs> well that's great i love that story um, and i'm glad that you made us watch this movie honestly. me too me too because i really loved this movie. Um, I think this is such a fascinating thing. And, and and I think this is such a different film. I mean, in general, but it all, it is such a different type of film that you and I usually talk about um, that I, I'm actually not nervous, but like I'm, I'm sitting here thinking like, how do we, how do we approach talking about what this movie is? Because this movie doesn't have a story. It doesn't have characters. Not really. I mean, there are, there are people in the movie. There are people on the screen. Um, but it, it's, it's a, it is a comedy. It's funny sort of, well, here, let me, here, I'm going to sum it up with a quote I found from Roger Ebert that describes this film that I think nails this pretty perfectly. Instead of a plot, it has a cascade of incidents. Instead of central characters, it has a cast of hundreds. Instead of being a comedy, it is a wondrous act of observation. It occupies no genre and does not create a new one. It is a filmmaker showing us how his mind processes the world around him. That's perfect, Roger. Turns out Ebert was pretty good at this. Uh, I think that's a perfect encapsulation of this movie. 
and I'm enjoying. Uh, I'm going to enjoy getting to talk to you about it, but I, I need to know what you thought of it first, Matt. What did you What did you think of Playtime? Yeah, so I had uh, no exposure to this movie, to what it was, to what it was going to be doing. Uh, the first ten minutes was um, almost uncomfortable, as I was like, "What are we doing?" <laughs> and and then and I was it was very it was very intellectually stimulating to try to be like what is this because Mm -hmm. you're watching the movie begin. I almost encourage people to just watch the movie. Yeah. Stop. If if you have any mild curiosity at all right now, stop the movie and go stop the podcast and go watch the movie. Yeah. Cause 23rd greatest movie of all time. Maybe. Um, but (laughs) you know, I, I can see what would cause someone to put it up there and I'll just go into what I was going to say before the disclaimer, which is, um, you, you, you're having to figure out like, okay, what is the approach here? Because this is unlike anything I've ever seen. Uh, you know, you've got this totally static camera showing, showing a space Mm -hmm. and people are moving through the space and it is never clear who the protagonist is. Oh, there is no protagonist. There are just characters. Okay. So you're, you're figuring it out. There are just people and this, this, this couple over here is having this conversation this guy over here is cleaning up the, the floor. Um, this this military guy is wandering around, and you're you're just you're experiencing the film basically as you would experience just like the lobby of an airport that you mm-hmm. happen to be actually sitting in. Except it's you know they're characters. There's drama happening, and and then as the movie goes, like it it's it kind of get, gains momentum. And is able to just do these incredibly complex things that you you didn't know that film was capable of as a medium, where there's like multiple, I don't know, like literally dozens of different sort of like characters weaving in and out of of the 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 environment, and it's kind of up to you what you're going to pay attention to. Yeah, you know, like there's like six things happening on the screen at the same time. By the way, just it's very hard for you and I to talk about this because we have this like <laughs> hyper developed toolkit of like ways of talking about like plot and narrative and character and and like the tools of of cinema. None of that applies, yeah. right? It's like effectively everyone watching this movie is watching a different movie because I. I'm confident that there are things that I could say. Like, I did, didn't you love that bit with the um, uh, uh, the 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 vacuum cleaner or whatever? And then we like you and I would have both been paying attention to totally different parts of that because yeah. because it's not like a normal comedy. It's like it's set up and like the joke is clear and there's like a structure to it and the the language of like what the camera is doing. And what the actors are doing is is you know precisely choreographed. This is just more like the, I don't know how much of this was sort of ad libbed, um, but it but if it was ad libbed, then that's even more impressive actually because of how well it works. Um, well, I, I don't think it was. I think actually the the impressive thing about this to me is that it was incredibly tightly choreographed. Mm-hmm. Um, like filming of this this movie took years. Um, it, it, at the time of release, it was the most expensive French film ever released, um, because basically I think, uh, Jacques Tati built like an entire city that was like two buildings and some streets that they called Tati town, um, that they filmed all this in. And like, he took weeks and weeks and weeks on the, the big restaurant climax scene, which is 45 minutes of this movie. Um, and, and he had to like choreograph the background players first and get all that down and then the foreground it all incredibly complicated um and i think it is it, it is one of those things where the movie comes off as chaos right it's just chaos and things happening all over the place but it's so tightly controlled that i think this is why you know this is considered the work of a master filmmaker because you're absolutely right that like 
at any given moment on the frame, six different jokes are happening at the same time. And there's no possible way for you, the viewer, to pick up on every single one of them. Um, it, it, it also makes our, our job harder because like we're sitting here pretending like we're the people that can watch a movie once and then talk about it as if we know what we're talking about. And yeah, there's like 12 different things going on in each scene. Um, yeah. It, it's the, it's right. fascinating. <laughs> yeah, the, the thing I, I I was thinking earlier was like, this is like watching a movie from some other dimension where <laughs> where there's just a whole different history of cinema where there's a whole different language of what the camera is doing and what that's telling you and what actors are and what a scene is it, it's almost it's almost a a deconstruction of the idea of drama down to the most basic elements and then and then reconstructing something that's familiar but quite different out of those pieces mm -hmm. while you know it ends up being totally charming and like totally well paced and totally well edited but like from a different universe at the same time um it's it's just it's just a, a delightful artifact and i see why critics love it right it's like oh yeah like this is what you can do with the medium of film and it's so masterful, right? It's like so masterful at the at this thing that it's doing that you had no idea that film could do. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I didn't really say this yet, but like it's just it's very funny. Like it, it, it's yeah, a comedy, it is, yeah. and so you're you're just you're you you constantly got this little smile on your face, and it's also really like intellectually engaging because you're sort of it, there's 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 very little language. It's not mm -hmm. that there's none. But almost all of the gags are visual. In fact, I would yeah. say all of the gags are visual. All of, all of the gags are sort of situational and visual and things that you're having to, to sort of figure out as you're like watching characters do things or try to do things. And um, it's so, and it becomes like incredibly complex with, you know, especially the nightclub scene toward the end where it's like yeah. this, the, the nature of the movie is that it starts out very sterile open space everything moves kind of slowly a lot of the jokes are actually just like you know how long can you watch a man poke at a chair <laughs> um but then like by the end it's like detail you know you know layer upon layer and detail upon detail and it's just this complete chaos and it's funny and it's it's also like delightful and nostalgic in this interesting way where mm -hmm. I found my, I found myself being like, oh, I wish I was in this fantasy version of Paris. <laughs> it, really? It was a feel, it, it, yeah, I wish I was in this crazy nightclub that's like falling apart around you. And, okay, and, I, I guess that makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Like, like that's it's like the best party I've ever seen on film. <laughs> I, I don't even think I'm exaggerating. It's like everybody's having a great time. Like the the nightclub's falling apart around them, and everybody's just such a like happy joyful person that they just like let the disintegration of the nightclub play into their fun uh, yeah. and like like they were like get up on stage and replace the band with the band leaves and you're just like not only is it funny but you're just like it's like joyful um sure yeah i mean that's that's one interesting thing about this movie to me is so so to, to take a, a step back here a bit the thing that this movie is doing with all this farcical nonsense we've been talking about is it's commenting on how absurd it is to live in the modern world. And of course, it's the modern world from 1967, but I think we can relate to some of this stuff. The The, the movie is, for the most part, entirely in gray. It is a bunch of high-rise buildings that all look alike like an office building and a, a store and an airport basically all look the same everyone's wearing gray like when things are in color it immediately pops because everything's gray and it is kind of kind of poking fun and critiquing how ridiculous and and sometimes drab it can be to live in this world like one of the one of the jokes that the movie makes a, a whole lot is you know we're in the airport and there are all these posters to visit all these different countries around the world and in every single one of the posters it's a, a classic like um uh location like hawaii and you can like see a beach but in 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 front of the poster in center frame of the poster is a big stark boring high-rise building and that is true everywhere there's one visit mexico 
big, big gray high rise building in front of pyramid visit Paris, big high rise gray building in front of Eiffel tower, uh, visit the United States, big high rise building in front of grand Canyon. Like it's, it, it is, it is definitely a movie that's, that's commenting on the way in which modernity kind of kills the beauty. Like, Paris in this movie, Paris is a beautiful city. Paris is one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Paris in this movie looks terrible. It looks drab and there's no life anywhere. I mean, like we, we see the Eiffel Tower in a reflection of a door, yeah. but but um, one of the most beautiful bridges in the world is like covered by a, another building. They reference the bridge. They say it's over there, but we can't see it because there's a boring modern high rise building there. So it is definitely a movie that's critiquing and commenting on these things. But I do think it's interesting because you, they're, they're, to me, it's a tale of two movies because we move from that into the the restaurant nightclub scene. And I think that scene is doing something very different. Like the jokes about the silliness of the gadgets that people have, the, the, the ugliness of these chairs that are literally everywhere. Um, all those jokes go away. And it's just this really interesting commentary on, oh, this is just a restaurant that really wasn't ready to open, but does. And here's a comedy of, of errors that happens uh, through the course of the night in the restaurant. And I, I honestly, Matt, haven't been able to like tie together those two ideas to each other very neatly yet i'm curious what your take on it is yeah i don't think i have a great answer uh because again the movie almost resists the the concept of plot Mm -hmm. um and because it resists the concept of plot it's difficult to apply the lens of theme now theme is a very general concept right theme can Mm -hmm. resonate even in the you know set dressing and choice of actors and performances and so forth but it's hard to pin down so the 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 vibe that i got was something like you know once once the sun goes down basically the real paris comes to life and these are basically the people who are going to party all night and have a great time and and it's a much warmer, more colorful atmosphere, right? Mm-hmm. At, at, mm-hmm. At, at night, the people who come to the club, increasingly colorful as the film goes on, uh, in contrast, like you said, to the grays and blacks and whites of the beginning. And and, and it's sort of saying that, you know, this, this city is still here. The city is the people. Um, it's just that we, you know, for some reason, we've built this sterile sort of uh, facade over everything. I, I don't like that doesn't feel like all of it doesn't feel like most of it, but th- th- that was my feeling coming away from it was that, you know, these tourists have come to Paris to see Paris, right? Mm-hmm. And they walk around a bunch of glass buildings that are identical <laughs> to the glass buildings in every other city. That's, yeah. that's it. And then this one tourist who's sort of the the woman that we're following yeah, she's um, wearing green, which makes her stand out because she's like one of the only people in color. Yes, and she's also like young and beautiful, and all the mm-hmm. other tourist women are are older and yeah, frumpy looking, and it, it's it's it, she stands out intentionally. And we follow her, and she goes, you know, c- comedic events occur, and then she ends up going to the nightclub slash restaurant at the end, and and it's like, well, she's kind of the only one that got to see the real Paris, which was the people um Mm -hmm. and uh and and that's that's i don't know i think that's that's the best i can do i I do love you know what what you said a minute ago about like you you see the you you only ever see the monuments and buildings in like reflections um which is a really cool touch and i think that's just showing like yeah it's it's all around you just you're just not seeing it you know yeah like the, the the modernity focuses on not the beautiful ancient architecture and and stuff like that but on the 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 modern conveniences of the world which are in in the world of this movie absurd like like the one of the big things is that it's not even a vacuum that you were talking about it's just a broom that they've attached two headlights to. (laughs) yeah you're right (laughs) that's all it is and like it's just absurd and ridiculous and like the the wonderful scene where the the one guy um the uh, quote-unquote main character it's the actor that's that's played by the director 
um, that Mr. Hulot, who, who I think has been in Tati's several of Tati's films, he's, he's a recurring character that he plays himself in these movies, um, is, is trying to meet someone. And there's this whole ridiculous scene where the doorman lets him in um, and then has to work this incredibly complicated machine to call someone over who has to walk down this incredibly long hallway. Um, and then just his entire purpose was to usher him into another room where he tells him to wait and then walks off leaving him again. Right. Like yeah. th- this is, this is the absurdity of modern life. And, and I agree with you that the point is that all these stuff, it's, it's still there. It's like th- th- that it isn't a reflection does say that it is still there. It's just, that's not what we're focusing on. Yeah. But one of the interesting things to me is the ending of this movie. And, and I think this leads into what you were talking about. So we have this incredibly drab, dry, boring, sterile, first part then we have this this fancy restaurant right it's supposed to be this incredibly high class fancy restaurant where everything has to be perfect everyone has to be perfect the food is is perfect everything's perfect and that all goes horribly horribly wrong and it turns into a big mess but a big mess that everyone is having a a fun time with and then when we leave that restaurant in the morning we go back out into the city the same city we were in and what happens there's color everywhere there's there's balloons and and it's it's like a circus right like like circus music is playing as as cars go around in a circle around the the um uh the roundabout but like children are are have balloons and and the sun is bright and shining and there's plant life for the first time and and everything's alive again um and and i i really scratched my head up at, at while watching it like what happened here what 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 caused that and i think you're spot on that it's the it's the absurdity it's the it's the reckless messiness of the time in the nightclub that that we get to observe that leads us back into oh we can walk out of this messy nightclub and maybe appreciate the the beauty of the world a little bit more and focus on the absurdity of of modern life a little less yeah yeah, I, I I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Yeah, I mean, especially the contrast is drawn toward just like the awful sterility and inhumanity of the, the way everyone behaves in the first part, where it's it's borderline dystopian, mm-hmm. maybe even literally dystopian. Actually, just like how formal and cold everyone is for most of like the first half of the movie, and it is played yeah. as a joke often, but it's like a joke. It's like an uncomfortable joke where you're just you're 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 sort of identified with monsieur hulot and the like awkwardness and and feeling of being a poor fit um you know like in the same way that that the woman that we follow is dressed in green i think i think hulot is dressed in uh brown which is a more a more earthy color and and he has a pipe while while everyone else smokes cigarettes so he's just Mm -hmm. kind of this this old-fashioned kind of throwback and you just while it is very funny, it's also it, like uncomfortable to watch yeah. to just be be stuck with this guy who's just, you know, in 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 some regards, it's more uncomfortable than like watching Mr. Bean or something because <laughs> because Mr. Bean, you're like, it's fine to laugh at Mr. Bean because Mr. Bean is is like ridiculous, mm-hmm. but 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 it feels slightly bad to laugh at Monsieur Hulot because he doesn't seem like a ridiculous fool that you're supposed to laugh at at least that was how i felt um and and so that it left me feeling you know it's a very nuanced kind of comedy because it left me feeling a little bit different than just like oh so funny to laugh at these silly situations it's like we're feeling feeling other things in addition to that um yeah yeah no i i agree with you this is not a comedy that holds your hand this is not a comedy that explains to you what is funny and why it's funny um it it definitely forces you to to deal with your feelings i think one of the most interesting sequences for me in that regard is when his friend calls him into his apartment house like he Mm -hmm. hulo the entire movie is like running into people he knows and they're just like violently yanking him to places he doesn't want to go yeah. um and one example of this is is he gets pulled into uh this old friend of his uh, i guess uh, we don't even know if he's really <laughs> like he knows who low that's all we know uh-huh. um he gets pulled into his house and the movie does this really interesting thing where um we're, we're standing the camera is outside of the house but the house or the apartment rather has a big uh wall 
sized window in it and everyone's watching TV uh, on on the the right wall, and then we also get to see the apartment on the right, where everyone's watching TV on the left wall. And so the, uh, Tati positions the camera to where we can't see the TVs; we just see these two group of people looking at each other, and and be, they're reacting to the television. But the camera films it in a way as, as such that they're reacting to each other. Um, and it, it's a scene that is entirely silent because we are outside. So all we are hearing is the noises of the street, people walking by, cars driving by. We don't hear anything going on inside those two different apartments, but we're just silently observing people observe each other. Um, and you don't even know what to make of it because there's moments where like a guy starts like taking his his tie and shirt off and like the woman's like uh, uh, on the other apartment is reacting to that um it, it's such a fascinating sequence and w one of those things when we talk about like how how complicated and and uh choreographed this movie was like you need to put the camera in the right place and yeah. the way he moves it around and shifts it with all this stuff really really interesting stuff um yeah. just the way in which we observe like cuz cuz we're observing them observing each other even though they're not really observing each other it's just the camera makes it seem like they i don't know yeah <laughs> weird it's weird yeah there's a couple directions i want to ping off there i'll, I'll go with whichever one you you choose all right number one is sound design number two is the symbol of glass throughout the whole film um which one do you which one of those two do you want to talk about <laughs> we're i mean both uh let's go sound design first yeah so very like huge hugely important the most important thing um uh j j like the importance of sound in this movie it's, it's important to the comedy a, lo mm -hmm. a lot of the humor is just like things making funny sounds yeah um or things not making sounds as the case may be like <laughs> the sl like the slamming doors bit was so good the, the, the slamming door that doesn't make sounds uh you know so so to 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 mention glass for a second, the fact that so often we're watching things from outside of a building and the building is a glass building. So we can see everything as if, mm -hmm. as if there were no barrier, but we can't hear anything. Mm -hmm. And, but then instead we hear what's happening outside. Sound is also very often used to draw our attention. There'll be 16 things happening in the frame. You're, it's, it's in a restaurant there's 40 characters on the screen yeah but the 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 sound that they bring to the four of the sound mix will be the sound associated with the thing that he wants you to pay attention to in this moment and it works really well yeah it works so well <laughs> I, was, I was like <laughs> i mean i was aware of the importance of sound design but i'm like wow you can you can draw my attention to like one pair of people having a conversation or the fact that somebody slipped over there in the background or just any detail in this scene by having the sound associated with that event be the thing that is most salient because mm -hmm. your your eyes will find it right yeah um, it's it's just so interesting how that works i think that's a really great point but i also think it's interesting how that works in the opposite way as well because i also think uh tati uses sound to distract you like mm. there are uh, the the scene i'm thinking of is, is in the airport when we're kind of sitting here in this in this wide take just watching people mill around the airport and then a guy just drops his cane <laughs> in the middle of the scene and you just this loud clack and your eyes immediately go to the sky as if because because in the language of film you're we're being told oh something is about to happen here and what what happens he just he just picks up his cane mm -hmm. and then he walks away and nothing happens. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That's, that's all. And, and like, maybe there were like five things that were happening that were funny that I missed because my <laughs> eyes immediately went to cane guy dropping his cane. And, and, and it, it's because I think these are two things doing similar things, but for different reasons it's just really interesting because this is a movie yeah. like to, to, if you haven't watched this movie it's really difficult to explain this tati hates close-ups he hates them he never does them every single shot in this movie is a wide shot and so the frame is stuffed and one of the things that i felt is like i i, I kept feeling my eyes get pulled to one corner of the frame 
while knowing that I was therefore missing stuff in the other parts of the frame. Yeah. And then like, so I was like frantically searching uh, on my screen. Like, where do I want to look? And, and the, the, the movie doesn't always give you an answer for that question of where do you want to look? Sometimes it does. You're absolutely right. Sometimes he uses sound to say, okay, time to look here now. Sometimes he doesn't give you that out. Yeah. And it's like, where do I look? What do I see? I can't take it all in. The movie is not presenting the things in the frame in a way that I could take it all in at the same time. And it knows this. It, it's it's remarkable. It really is. It's one of the few movies where even while watching it, I was thinking this is going to be fun to rewatch because <laughs> because now I know like, OK, I watched I watched the joke with them putting the glass into the ice bucket. <laughs> now I want to but but I but I know I was conscious of there being like other things going on at that mm-hmm. moment. So when I rewatch it, I'm going to just be paying attention to other things. Yeah. And, and I feel like this is one movie where just every time you watch it is going to be a different experience. Yeah, totally. Cuz it's that that's there's a million instances of that, right? Mm-hmm. Um just probably whole, you know, background characters who I didn't even notice at all, you know, mm-hmm. like, like the, the, I'm trying to think of an example, you know, like the, the American businessman is, is sort <laughs> of a, it, he's sort of a clear character. Number one, he's speaking English. He's very boisterous. He's, he, he's loud. He takes up space. So I don't think anybody would miss the American businessman. Yeah. But like, but like, what about the woman he's with? I don't, I can't, you know, like she's a character, Mm -hmm. right? And there's like, there's literally like a hundred other characters like that where it's like they have their own through line through the story, but you weren't really paying attention to it because there's just so much going on. Um, Yeah. So yeah, I I do look forward to rewatching this. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the joys of it. And, you know, like talking about this list, I think it's so interesting and, and intentional that if a movie appears on this list of these these films that, that critics love, I feel like it has to be doing one of two things or or maybe one of several things. It has to be doing something genre defining, like it is the first to do something, um, doing something, you know, technologically defining or doing something that nobody's just ever done before and, mm-hmm. and, and, and just making like pushing the boundaries of what film is. And I think this is, this falls into so many of those categories, which is probably why it's why it's uh, as high up on the list as it is. Because like Ebert said, like, it's not like this is a new genre. Like this is not Rashomon, right? Where, where Kurosawa makes Rashomon and everyone's like, holy shit, this is an amazing way to do a movie. This is an amazing structural conceit. We're going to copy this 700,000 times and make so many movies like this. And it's going to be so awesome. This, no one makes movies like this. No one, no one, like every once in a while, you might have someone that says, I'm going to do something Tati esque, right? But like nobody makes this movie at all, ever. Um, And it's just like this unique thing that existed once upon a time and then that's it. And yeah. I, don't, I don't know, it's, it, no, it, it I, makes it, it makes it like when you watch a lot of movies, you start to see a lot of things in movies. And it's not like I dislike those movies, but like getting to see something that you described as like a movie from another dimension, I think is so fun and pleasurable. Yeah. yeah I mean, I've never seen anything like this. I've never heard anything described as that yes. That's what made it so delightful is that it's unique to me. I mean, I, I'm not that big of a film connoisseur, I guess, because, but no, it, it, it was, um, uh, yeah, that's the, that's, it's like an experience, you know, mm-hmm. it's one of those, it's, it's like meow wolf. It's, <laughs> a, it's a weird, it's a weird thing from outside your comfort zone from outside your experience that is just delightful. And you didn't know anything could be like this. And it's kind of going to change the way I see movies. Cause it's yeah. like, huh, I didn't know you could do, any of these things and it gives you a sense of kind of degrees of freedom that you weren't aware of before. Yeah. Well, it breaks all the rules of filmmaking Mm -hmm. and intentionally. So like the, the, the opening sequence of this movie takes place in an airport and we don't know that for like 10 minutes Yeah, because there's, (laughs) there's no signifier in this movie that they're in an airport. You know, you know how you would traditionally demonstrate to, to an audience that you're in an airport 
You show an airplane. Yeah, yeah. You show an airplane landing, and then you cut over to the building next to where the airplane is. This just opens in a room that looks like an office building, and there's like random people walking around. There's a nurse. There's a she. There's, and it turns out she's not a nurse, and she's holding a bundle of blankets. And then you hear a baby cry, so you go, "Oh, the nurse is holding a baby." And then the movie's like, "No, actually, the couple in the lower left hand corner of your screen, there's a bassinet that you've never seen before until you heard the baby noise." <laughs> And, and she's handing – she's got some paper towels. She's filling the worst-placed bathroom in the world. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and and in the background, there's a mannequin, and then she comes alive, and then she's a mannequin again. And it's just like, oh, okay. And then finally, finally, we pull back and say, oh, yeah, this is an airport, by the way, in uh-huh. case you didn't know. Uh, it, it that Nobody does that. Like that's not movie making. <laughs> it's just absurd. And yet it, it works and it's hilarious. Yeah. 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 It's it's hilarious. So so I want to talk about glass now. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, we got off track. Glass. No, no, we did that, that, that we did exactly what we needed to do. But but I did just want to say like it's funny, but there is this very firm artistic hand there where like you said, he built this whole city. He mm-hmm. clearly has a very solid philosophy of what he's trying to do. And glass is the symbol that pervades the whole movie. Like we, yep. so we talked already about the idea that so many of these scenes we're watching what's happening inside of basically a glass building or behind a glass pane. Like these people, their apartment has a gigantic floor to ceiling, wall to wall window that just looks out on the street with no shutters or anything, no curtains. Everybody can see into their homes, right? Mm-hmm. This is this is not a conceit. This is like actually implied to be the way these people live in this fictional world um and you know you've got the 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 repeated sort of joke of like using a a door made out of glass is just a stupid idea um because people the the man the the one guy walks into the door and smashes his nose (laughs) um i think I think two people walk into doors and smash their noses actually yeah. at different points the the door to the uh to the, to the nightclub breaks and then for the rest of the movie the valet is holding the handle of the glass <laughs> door and moving it as if he's opening the door for people and everybody's acting as though he's actually <laughs> holding the door and then like he'll he'll like close it on some guy and it's and and just like endless comedy from the idea that the door is broken and the doorman is now holding this knob Mm -hmm. um and and getting tips by the way for just moving the knob out of the way (laughs) um and yet all the drunk people wandering into the club just are ignoring that completely which is which is great too right like that's another way in which glass is the symbol where where the 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 drunk it's like the drunk people can see the truth whereas it's the civilized people who act as though glass is this like it's you know a a glass wall to them is is a wall yeah where where, but like glass you know glass isn't real (laughs) it's it it, and the the idea that glass isn't real is this like thought that i have because it's like they 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 have the glass from the broken door and they they're looking for ice for the champagne and they pour the ice uh, they pour the broken glass into the champagne uh uh container to to treat and and obviously that's not going to do anything to the champagne it's fake (laughs) right and it's a joke but it's like we're continuing to use this idea of glass as not real and distancing and and shutting out sound and being a sort of false barrier and and, you know the, the the glass is the symbol of the earlier part of the movie and then we break the door and now we're in the later part of the movie where there's there's still some glass there's there's yeah there's, there's not none but it's just like this is a great this is a thing to me where it, it's both a symbol and it's a comedic element and it's plays into the sound design it's just endlessly rewarding to think about this specific aspect of the movie um yeah. anyway. I, I really like that too because in the the final sequence of the film um you have the glass cleaner uh, cleaning the glass right and mm-hmm. he's he's tipping it to clean it and when he tips it it's almost as if the entire world tips because you have the the people in the bus the tourists in the bus getting back ready to go back to the airport and every time he tips the glass they make a noise like they've just been 
tipped on their angle, right? They yeah, like go, yeah. whoa. And and it, that that is a really interesting idea of um kind of kind of the the conceit of the glass and the power it does and doesn't have over mm-hmm. over society that we're seeing. And, and and like it's interesting because you know, if you step back and think about this for a minute, this is a movie heavily about observation, right? We are just observing this world. And what is a lens but just another piece of glass we're, mm. we're viewing the world through. Love it. Um, and it, it, it strikes me as like, we, we talk about trying to, trying to come up with a cohesive overall theme for this film. And, and maybe the truth is closer to what you said, which is just, this is just how this guy sees the world. And it doesn't have to have a cohesive idea to it because he's just looking around and going, Hey, isn't this silly? Isn't all this stuff just silly? And like the whole, the whole restaurant thing is this idea of this is supposed to be an incredibly exclusive, incredibly high class, you know, the best of the best of the best. This is like 400, 500, $600 meal. Right. Um, and it's just an illusion. It's just, it's, it's not even finished yet. Like they're not done. Uh Um, and, and, and all of it's bullshit. And like the, 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 the thing that sh- stuck out to me so much was the the fish that they brought to that table. <laughs> I was hoping you would say the fish. <laughs> First of all, the fish looks so gross. All yeah. the food looks disgusting, by the way, like uh-huh. all of it. And this idea that it's cooler to to cook and spice the food at the table. Uh-huh. Um, and it's done like six times, like like th- I think three different waiters spice that fish yeah over the course of the movie and there's no way it tastes good there's there's no. absolutely no way but it's like this is what high class is oh it's so fancy so proper it's and it's all bullshit yeah. it's all bullshit yeah well I, I, the so my understanding of that specific joke was that like no nobody felt in charge of that table yeah, at a certain yeah. point mm-hmm. and so the waiters just kept coming by and then like yeah. redoing it because they were like not sure what the protocol was and then eventually that that couple just leaves i guess um because because somebody tries to serve the fish finally and and the people who are sitting at the table are like that's not for this table um well i think the people the the original people that the fish was served to aren't even there anymore (laughs) yeah 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 it's different people that are sitting at the table at that point yeah i think they just i I was so i wasn't sure because i didn't notice them leave I didn't um, notice them leave either, but it's they, entirely, I, they looked different. Yeah, I, I I agree. I think it was a different couple, but I don't. If the movie did show them leave, then it was one of these background elements that I just missed because I was paying attention to something else. Um, but no, it's great. The, the fish, the fish is great. The bar where it's it's getting sweltering hot and the electrical system is shorting out, and and then they turn it on, and then God. immediately a woman's uncomfortable because. The air is blowing on her skin so hard that it's moving, uh-huh. and so they just turn it off again. Yeah, yeah. We could just we could just keep. I going. mean, we could just literally go right. through every single joke through the entire movie. I, like, but but I think I think we're the, the point is that this whole that this is looking at the world and saying the world is absurd, the world is insane, the world is crazy. All this stuff is is just illusory, and we're missing we're missing the forest sometimes. Like. Again, one of my favorite bits is the the beautiful Greek column turned into a trash can. Uh, yeah, that this is beautiful architecture, ancient, incredible feats of engineering. We use it as a trash can now because we've lost sight of of what is beautiful and matters in this world. Oh, and yeah, uh, um, the the end of the movie is kind of returning to that. Oh no, we found it. Um, there's also a lot more children in the end of the movie, like. This is this is again something that I, I wonder if we're making a, a specific commentary about that the, the the color returns in the movie at the end of it and what do we see everywhere we see children and it's like maybe maybe Tati's talking about how you know kids give us get, bring bring life and color back to the world um, the, yeah. the things we forget in our in our uh, walking through modern life that we forget what matters and kids allow us to re-experience that I don't know. Yeah, I noticed that. I I totally agree. I mean, just on a very practical level, I was like, "Oh, it's the morning now," so mm-hmm. the kids are like on their way to school. Yeah. Um, and but then it also makes you think, like, yeah, the whole first part of the movie, you didn't see any children, and that's part of what made it feel so sterile. 
um, and and unapproachable. Um, and uh, and yeah, the you know children are this are this actual part of life that gets sort of shuffled to the side and put in a box uh, for the sake of you know this this uh, uh, proper city living that everyone mm-hmm. thinks they want. Um, yep. Well, um, it's so stupid. It's also stupid. It's so ugly. <laughs> like those stupid chairs that are everywhere. Like uh, another great detail of this movie is those chairs are literally everywhere. Yeah, like yeah. the house that he visits his friend at, the apartment, those are the chairs they use. And then like he sees them in the office building and then walks across the street and they're selling those chairs. Yeah. yeah. And like you said, the, like the joke the joke is that there's just nothing really special about the chairs. It's like yeah. everybody's decided – Oh look, you can push on it, and the back goes down. Isn't that? And and it's like, I don't. Well, why would I want that in it a feels chair? Like a bug, not a feature. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, but it, yeah, everybody's just. I mean, it, it, yeah, everything at that like like product expo or whatever it was is like, oh, this is all stupid. This is all ugly. And like you said, the the column turned into a trash can. It's it's all like, oh yeah, we're. We're tearing down what actually looks good, and we're elevating a broom with with uh, flashlights on it as something <laughs> super cool and desirable. Yeah. Um, and you know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, uh, it's it's great. I I, I loved this movie. Um, it's like it's a type of movie where like I don't know how to say this without sounding like it, it's an insult, but like I'm glad that not all movies are like this. Like I, I like this because it's unique and different and like you can watch a thousand movies and see nothing quite like this. Like I, I wouldn't want everyone to make movies like this. And, and I'm actually glad that like people don't make their entire career trying to replicate this specific type of thing. Yeah. Um, I agree that. Well, I, I don't know that anybody else could pull it off <laughs> too. <laughs> like I'm trying to think of any other director where I'm like, I want to see them try to make a Tati-esque film. Yeah. And, and I'm just like, no, I, I want them to do their thing. And I want Tati to have made the films that he made. <laughs> and that's fine. Yeah. I, I think the most depressing thing about this movie is that it didn't do well right yeah um, yeah yeah no one no one saw this movie um i mean i guess it's 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 sweet vindication that you know um however many years later s- s- 60 years later s- 65 a lot of years later uh it's it's largely considered one of the greatest films of all time but nobody nobody saw it although to be fair i read that part of the problem with that is tati refused to show it in any theaters that couldn't play 70 millimeter film uh, uh-huh. He refused to make a 30 millimeter cut because to him, the, the clarity of the image was so important because obviously the frame is so stuffed with things. He didn't want, he, he wanted people to be able to experience it in the, as, as high resolution as possible. Um, but that also severely limits how many, how many theaters can see this movie. But I also just think this was never a movie that was going to make a lot of money, right? Like yeah. this is never going to be a thing that like the, the world wants to see. Um, yeah. It's just so specific to itself right yeah it's one of those i I agree it's it's a weird curiosity that i'm super glad that i watched and that i think everyone would enjoy but also it is a weird curiosity um Mm -hmm. a lot of it's a lot of the joy of it comes from the novelty of it if there were 50 movies like this um i wouldn't be raving about it nearly as much i still would have said that it was a fun movie but i wouldn't be you know it's it's the novelty freshness and uniqueness of it that makes it what it is um and yeah, he spent, I think they just, the movie was incredibly expensive because he built yeah. this, you know, to call it a set seems reductive. He built this enormous like series of buildings and areas. Um, and I mean, I think it kind of financially ruined him, but part of me is like, what did you expect, dude? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's, there's part of me like the, the bohemian lover of art part of me is like, uh-huh. yeah, sp- spend all your money to make your passion project. And who cares if it doesn't make you any money? But obviously there's a more pragmatist part of me that's like, but also it's nice to have money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, or, or maybe there was a way that he could have made this more cheaply. Be just, I don't know. I, it, as you say, I'm glad it exists. I'm glad it exists exactly as it does. Yeah. It, it, yeah. 
he actually he was incredibly proud of this movie and i think he said that this is the only movie that he made that he feel like he made perfectly that he would like all the other movies he wished he could go back and make changes and this movie he said this is exactly the movie i wanted to make um and that's that's great to hear because this is the exact movie i wanted to watch this is yeah just so wonderful um you, you know i do i do understand his inclination to not release the movie in 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 a in anything other than a high res format because you know you just look at some of these screenshots where you've got like for example the four you know the four families in the four apartments and they're all on mm-hmm. the screen at the same time just imagine watching that and not being able to read the facial expressions of every character yeah. like that would suck yeah i mean it, yeah he's he's kind of setting a situation up for himself where he's like i hate close-ups i think close-ups are insulting and i think you should be able to see the entire actor uh in their performance but also then i need a resolution high enough to where you can see their faces in this long shot i'm going to create yeah 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 right um gosh what a what a movie i like if, if you have reached the end of this and are like oh maybe maybe i should check this out uh i'm not sure still please do please do this is this is a treat. It's a delight. It's two hours long, but it doesn't feel like it. It just kind of just moves and you're just yeah. kind of taken along for a ride as you like that. That's that's one of those interesting things where you're like, oh, the thing that propels you through a movie is characters and plot. And it's like, no, not not always. Actually, um, just intrigue is is enough sometimes. And yeah. this was a very intriguing experiment of a film. It is very strange to have a story sort of broken up into a million little bite-sized moments because like if your attention wanes for three seconds <laughs> you, you feel like you've missed so much but it's like uh-huh. well yeah there's not really like a thread that you're following there's yeah you just you missed the begin. you missed the ending of that bit and the beginning of this bit and now you're just lost <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but but then you're okay again 10 seconds later because yeah. you're just like okay we're doing this now whatever sure Yep, just um, wait wait a little bit of time and you'll be a okay. Yep, 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 yep. yep. Oh, I can't wait to watch this movie again. I have, I think I have another thirty six hours on my rental. Maybe I'll try to get another another watch in before my rental expires. Sure. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. I think that is going to do it for our conversation about playtime. Um, please check out the film if you haven't already. It's available to rent everywhere. And I think they released this one on Criterion. This this one feels like a good Criterion purchase because like you said, it's infinitely rewatchable. That's a good point. Yeah, sure. So from here, we've got uh, four more movies of our own to watch. And then of course, the number one film of all time, Jean Dielman, that we're going to watch after all that. So we've got Matt's fourth film coming up. That is the Tarkovsky film Stalker. Another one that I haven't seen also. So uh, I'm looking forward to that a whole lot, Matt. Me too. That is one that I'm very excited about. I've heard a whole lot of really good things about this film. Been wanting to watch it for a very long time. Yeah, me too. Ever since I, well, before this, but certainly ever since I read the the novel that it is based off of. Mm -hmm. So Uh, so we will get to that soon-ish. I'm not sure exactly when. Um, Sometime in in the future. All right. Do 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 doof. Uh, before we go for the week, though, Matt, I had a couple things I wanted to talk to you about. This is going to be one of those segments where I talk to you because you haven't watched either of these shows. But um, the first is Ahsoka, a show that we briefly talked about uh, two weeks ago. Was it? Um, I think I, I think I basically said I didn't want to talk about the show much on the show anymore because I wasn't liking it, and I don't want to just be the guy that shits all over the Star Wars things on the show well i kept watching it and i kind of i kind of like it now i think it's a good show huh i don't know how that happened i don't know how to process this i i can only handle and or being good i i I can't (laughs) deal with this yeah and, and and let me be perfectly clear here if if you came to me and said you can get a hundred more shows like ahsoka or one more show like Andor, I would pick Andor every time, uh-huh. hands down. No, like no, I wouldn't even think about it. Like Andor is like, in my opinion, leagues better than this thing. But I, I think it is really interesting. Like if you are into the kind of Star Wars thing that is very much just, I don't want to say classic Star Wars, but like 
what what people consider Star Wars these days. There's a whole lot of lightsabers. There's a whole lot of fighting. There's a whole lot of Jedi shit. Um, if, if you're into that, I think this is probably one of the better versions of that I've seen in these uh, in, in these latest Star Wars things. Um, they're doing things, Matt, in this in this show, like a character has to make a choice. And it's like a meaningful choice where you can completely understand why they would choose to do the wrong thing. And like the choice has consequences. And, and I just like, I can't tell you how refreshing that felt (laughs) in a star Wars thing to be like, Oh wow. I don't actually know what she's going to choose. And it's going to actually matter The the, the, the hinge of the story will move around what this one character chooses. I I had like a physical reaction when you said that. (laughs) I like I like sat up in my chair and got like like alert and surprised because I mean that's all we ask of our yeah. storytelling really it it yeah it's not that complicated that's uh-huh. all anybody ever means when they say good character writing is they mean yeah. that the characters have to make decisions and the decisions have to actually cohere with what the character is and mm-hmm. that it should matter uh well, shoot. Well, now okay, do I have here, to watch let me, this? Let me, let me take a step back here. Okay. Um, I, I still think this is a show that is largely a sequel to a, a cartoon that I haven't seen. Uh-huh. And I do believe that if you have not seen that cartoon, a lot of the show's plot elements and some of their character elements are a struggle. And so in, in utmost sincerity, as much as I'm enjoying this show now, I don't think I could recommend it to you because i think there's a lot of work you have to do to get through the first few episodes where you're just like Who, who's who's this what uh-huh. and the show just doesn't seem like it's very interested in doing in the work to explain any of that to you because it's kind of assuming you kind of know it already um but but the last two episodes so i think episode four and five have been one so i'm like okay i'm finally vibing with what the show is doing and so like yeah i, I don't know if I want to tell you watch three hours of something uh, to get to the good parts. Cause I don't, I'm, I'm against that, you know, generally. Um, but I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want it to go unsaid that this is a show that I kind of shit on a lot after watching the first episode. <laughs> and then uh, it got better from there, uh, which is, I think uh, the opposite of what these Filoni shows tend to do where they, uh-huh. I feel like the rest of them have started really strong and then just kind of dropped off. That's been my experience. Yeah. 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 I, I think I think that I'm sold enough to at least try the first episode. And if I just bounce off it hard, then I'm not gonna feel too bad. <laughs> yeah, but, that's uh, fair. I, I would expect you would. Um the, can I can I spoil something slightly for you and, and sure. the audience? Uh Anakin Skywalker comes back in an episode uh-huh. and, and I have never rolled my eyes harder at the fucking obsession with Darth Vader that we just continually have. And I'm so bored of Darth Vader. I'm so bored of him. I, this is like this fucking character arc has been going on my entire life and I don't care about it anymore. Yeah. Uh, that being said, how that moment is handled in this show, I actually liked because it's not really about him. Uh-huh. It's about this character, Ahsoka, who was apparently during the Clone Wars, his apprentice. Uh, that's not in any of the movies we watched, but that that happened. He had an apprentice. Her name was Ahsoka. She's the main character of the show, um, and she's struggling with having a master who turned into the most evil person on the world, the galaxy. Um, and so that is how he is framed in regards to her personal struggle. And it's like, oh, okay, so... His shit doesn't actually matter. It's mostly her shit. Thank you that I can deal with this now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would have felt that the, the bigger spoiler would have been like Anakin doesn't show up in a Star Wars show. <laughs> um, Touche. Touche. Uh, uh, I still like the, the, the remarkable thing about the show. And I, I told you this before we started recording, but like the more I see Twitter people talking about it, the less I like it because there's just <laughs> it's just like the most uh-huh. annoying tweets possible. Like. There's a, there's a scene when Anakin Skywalker is like walking towards Ahsoka and then he like flashes and it's Vader, not Anakin, and then flashes back. And someone's like, this is the best shot in Star Wars. And I'm like, you have got to be fucking kidding me. No, 
no. And it's not even a bad shot. It's just like the obsession with this particular thing. Just like, I'm so tired of it. Yeah. I mean, th- that's not like the worst thing I've ever heard of, but it's like, yeah, it's kind of an obvious thing to mm-hmm. do. Right. It's kind of, yeah. It, yeah. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. We, we knew he was Darth. You don't have to remind us he's Darth Vader. Like, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, it's a good show. The last the last two episodes have been good, I think. We'll see how it sticks the landing. Um, I do think it's really interesting how obsessed with whales Dave Filoni is. Like he's just really into whales and there keeps being whales in Star Wars. It's just it's wild. Yeah. Well we love space um, whales. Space whales. There's a lot of space whales recently in, in this this last year. This has been a, a year for space whales. That's true. That's true. Are the uh is is V'ger gonna come pick up the, the whales? Wait, that's <laughs> That's it's a just, wrong movie. Wrong doesn't movie. make any sense at all. Okay, no. never mind. You just you just jumped from <laughs> movie one to movie four. I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> well, Viger's from Star Trek one, right? And the Viger's whales are from just, Star Trek four. I think I think that's right. I honestly don't <laughs> order them by number. I order them by what happens in them. Um, but sure, that's close enough. You're <laughs> definitely V'ger is Star Trek one, I think. Okay. Unless Star Trek one is the one where they, uh, Star Trek one. Yeah, I think that's right. V'ger Star Trek one. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anyway, <laughs> that's Ahsoka. It's on Disney Plus now. Matt, uh, if you watch the first episode, you let me know uh, if you made it through it. I okay. I have a sneaking suspicion you will not. All right. But that's okay. Um, and then I also want to talk to you about this other show I watched uh, called One Piece. Now, here here's what the show's about, Matt. And um, I know you you know a little bit about the show. You know it's about pirates, but um, but I wanted to to tell you actually what it's about. So have have you seen the um, the classic Steven Spielberg film Ready Player One? Yes, I've seen uh, one of Spielberg's finest. Yes, yes. yeah, Spiel- probably top top three Spielberg at least. Um, <laughs> God. So, so uh, of course in that movie, uh, there's a very rich uh, game designer who dies and then leaves his big game designer treasure to all the players of the game. Well, this, uh, this new show one piece basically stole that entire plot line from Steven Spielberg's ready player one. They just wholesale took it. And so there's a pirate that dies and he leaves his pirate treasure for everyone to go find. Uh-huh. I mean, it's so blatant of a thief that they even used one in both titles. Like it's uh-huh. really unprofessional, I think. Um, but wow. the treasure is called one piece um, and all the pirates are looking for it. And uh, we, we go on an adventure with them. Um, I'll stop joking now. Cause I'm, I'm intentionally trying to piss off all the one piece fans. I hope it's working. Um, of course this is based off the manga, which is based off an anime, which is like a thousand episodes long and, and I'm never watching ever, ever St- stop. Please stop asking me to watch one piece. I'm not doing it. Um, but I watched this show and it's not bad actually. Um, as much joking, I think the concept is fun, you know, like secret pirate treasure hidden out there and all the pirates in the world are trying to find the treasure uh, and trying to screw each other over while doing it. Um, it's, it's very anime. Um, I, I think one of the thing, one of the good things I guess you could say about the live action adaptation is that it captures the feeling of the anime style of animation um, with while still being live action, uh, which is impressive. It, it captures the certain, certain, energy and tone and and oddness of costuming and character expression that i think uh is a signature of a lot of anime um which is i think why a lot of people a lot of fans of the anime seem to really like the show um Mm -hmm. so that's cool and i don't hate it um there there's it's weird it's very weird like in the second episode there's like a clown pirate who uh, ate a piece of fruit that allows him to rip his body into pieces and throw them at people. Okay. Uh, which is a little weird, but the main character is a, a character named straw hat Luffy, who also ate a piece of fruit that makes he's rubber. He, his body, he's like, he's like uh, Mr. Fantastic basically. Um, okay. And I, I was not expecting any of that stuff, by the way. I just thought, oh, this is just an anime about pirates trying to find a pirate treasure. But no, no, no. There's superpowers and sea monsters and uh, a whole a whole bunch of stuff. 
I, I think the the thing the thing that's keeping me in the show is the character of the main character, which is Straw Hat Luffy, um, um, is kind of endearing in a way that you can't help but love him because he's yeah. just like this kind of relentlessly positive uh force for good in in this world that is very dark and and dim and miserable um while also being incredibly colorful and energetic which is the the great uh juxtaposition of this whole show but he like you can't help but fall in love with him and he's really propelling me through a show where there's a lot of very traditional anime characters like there's the the I call him Michael esque because these are the the favorite Michael characters in anime. Is are always the ones that just stand off to the side and go like, huh, yeah. "Yeah, I don't care yeah. about any of this stuff." And those those ones always annoyed the shit out of me. And they have those in this too. Uh, but but Luffy is is such a presence that it, it bites through all that stuff. Um, I don't know. It's it's decent. I I, I wouldn't okay. say I'm in love with it. I wouldn't say like watching this made me go, "Oh my god, I need to watch the anime." right this very second um i i don't think i like again yeah. i'm never going to do that but uh um, uh-huh. i don't know it's not it's not bad i guess is yeah. the best thing i can say about it yeah you know i it's funny you mentioned that the idea of, of him just being endearing um because i've always felt like this is this is the hard this is the thing that's hard to express about naruto is like yeah the character of naruto is is just like lovable doofus it's mm-hmm. it's impossible to dislike Naruto as a character, um, but like that that anime is like very serious, like around that character. Um, I've also recently watched some episodes of One Punch Man with my kids, and that's a show where the the real charm of it is exactly the same thing. Where it's it's the the the, the titular One Punch Man is this just just lovable bloke. Like mm-hmm. there, there's no, it, it's not because he, you know, is one punch man and can blow people away with one punch. It's because he's this totally unpresupposed, pre, how do you say that word? Unprepossessing. I don't mm-hmm. know how you say that word. Anyway, he, he's just this, he's just this guy who you like and you want him to succeed at whatever he wants to succeed at. And like, I, I do find this is like the secret code to animes that you and I will enjoy is like, are they kind of centered around a, a a likable human character and then you can kind of be crazy around that character and i can still get into it um yeah. but but if it's just like a totally self-serious anime i tend to have a harder time and um yeah it's just an interesting observation about apparently what our tastes are oh for sure for sure yeah i i, I think it's it, those kind of characters win me over i i wonder like how many people that watch this anime would consider him like their favorite character in the anime. I, I, I suspect it's higher than it would be in some other different things. You know, you, you, the, 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 the gruffer badasses that actually have a heart of gold underneath characters are usually more popular. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but man, you got me thinking about how many times, how, how many animes we've watched where I like this exact character yeah. archetype and it makes yeah. me like the show it's a lot of them and, and also this is them. like i i know you you had a problem with death note which is one of the animes that i like mm-hmm. but death note is very very self-serious yep um i think i think i also liked uh psychopaths more than you for similar reasons whereas uh-huh. you did like uh mob psycho somewhat uh-huh. and you did like ping pong somewhat uh-huh. which are both less self-serious and kind of have like a core likable human character um, yeah. at, at the heart of them i mean i would even say spike and cowboy bebop is kind of like that not like yeah. as much as this character but like I, this the lovable doofus yeah lead is a yeah 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 i agree i agree about cowboy bebop yeah because that the, the fact that spike is kind of an idiot is more central to his character than the fact that he's a badass he, he is mm-hmm. both things of course yeah um yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and that's, that's, that's what's kind of keeping me go through it. Like there's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of anime nonsense in this. Obviously it's, it's based off an anime and I think it's, it, it's, it's actually kind of impressive. Like, you know, I've watched some of these other live action adaptations that haven't done so well. Like I, I actually watched the, the Netflix death note thing, which was it, dreadful. It was real bad. Uh-huh. I mean, I didn't like the anime death note, but like it's, it's brilliant compared to this thing. Um, <laughs> 
And so it is really interesting that this is this is kind of you know the poster child for this is how you do this in live action. I do think there's interesting things where just I, I and again I haven't watched a second of the anime, so I don't know. But there's things like there's there's a, a group a group called Marines in this, which are basically like the the sea police, um, and they all wear this very distinct uniform. And the uniform to me looks very silly. And I wonder if this is the type of thing where it maybe wouldn't look as silly in animated form, but when you try to carbon copy this uniform into reality, it just makes it look a little silly or maybe it's supposed to look silly. I, I don't know. Um, but I, I noticed that a few times where some of the stuff just looks a little, a little silly and it makes me question, is this supposed to look silly or is this just what happens when you copy paste in live action mode? Um, I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't answer your question because I have no idea, but like the animation style of the of the anime is very Looney Tunes, um, very colorful, very big. Yeah. So I I, I kind of doubt that anything is meant to be taken super seriously. I'm speaking from total ignorance, though. I just I, I've seen stills of, of the of the anime is pretty much mm-hmm. it. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it does, it does do that thing that anime does. And, and like, look, I don't like anime. Uh, I've made that pretty clear, but I do think it does a lot of things good sometimes. And, and, and the way it kind of can vacillate between this incredibly silly absurdism to this incredibly serious melodrama. Uh-huh. I think anime can do a really good job at that sometimes. And, yeah. I think one of one of the the strengths of the show is that it can manage to do that as well. That that the show is very very silly for a lot of the time, but it does get to points where it, it really like really dives into that melodrama in a way that I think works. Um, sure, sure. So I, I I don't know. I'll probably keep watching it. Um, it's not like appointment viewing for me. It's not like every free moment I'm like, oh my god, I have to watch this. But I've enjoyed myself with the two episodes I've seen. Cool. Um maybe i'll check that out could my kids uh, watch that you think ooh i don't think so so the interesting <laughs> thing about like the the rating at the top um always says like nudity and like th- there's definitely violence in it um it, it can get really dark i, I think I think they could probably watch it. Yeah, I, 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 think I think I'm probably just overthinking it. Um, I mean, I guess I'll maybe uh, be ready with the pause button, but um, and, I haven't and, seen any nudity yet. But when the the Netflix thing pops up at the top of start of every episode, it says like all the all the reasons why it's the rating it is, and I've seen uh-huh. nudity in it every time, huh. and I'm like, huh. Who's going to get naked? <laughs> I wonder if they mean like, do people have, yeah, I, I, who knows, man. It's, who knows? It's, it's weird. Yeah. So yeah, that's One Piece. It's on Netflix. I think all of the first season. And I think I read today that it just got picked up for a second season. So obviously it's doing fairly well. Um, you know, I, I think anime fans are probably some of the hardest people to please when it comes to stuff like this. And it seems like from what I've seen around the interwebs that, they're all pretty positive on it, um, which is great news. So there we go. That's that's good. That's a good sign. Yeah. I don't know who's going to find the one piece and be king of the pirates, though. Oh, apparently you, you're become king of the pirates. Um, oh, okay. Because it's just like Ready Player One because they just stole yeah. that from. It's going to be me. I'm going to find the one piece. <laughs> Let just now that the jokes are, I I despise Ready Player One. That's all uh-huh. very clear to people, right? I yeah, I hate I, that book and movie very very much. I think I think that's clear. I think to me the only comment on Ready Player One is like I don't understand why Steven Spielberg was attracted to it in the first place. It, yeah, it's I mean, very, yeah, it's it's like it's it's like imagine making that decades after you know the Matrix came out. And it's like such a more such a lukewarm, uninteresting, paltry, <laughs> <laughs> just thing. Uh, yeah, uh, it's just a, so mis- so strange, so strange. Did I <laughs> did I ever tell you about um the what uh, in, in one of the nerdiest parts of my life? Um, I was very excited about Final Fantasy fourteen coming out. 
the uh, the MMORPG video game. Uh-huh. And I was on a message board where a bunch of people were very, also very excited about Final Fantasy XIV came out. And we were like forming a community about how excited we were about Final Fantasy XIV coming out. And someone's like, let's do a book club while we wait for Final Fantasy XIV to come out. And I was like, I like books. Hell yeah. And um, someone picked Ready Player One. And I was like, okay. And I read it. And I hated it. Uh-huh. And I went into the book club conversation and just shit all over it because I did not like it at all. Uh-huh. And and then no, nobody talked to me anymore. <laughs> Everybody else loved the book and nobody wanted to talk to me anymore. And I, like I didn't do it like to be the contrarian guy. I just went in there thinking that everyone else would think the same thing about this book that I thought was really stupid. And it turns out nobody did. And I was like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, everyone. I didn't mean to destroy your, your enjoyment of this book. Well, I feel like the uh I feel like the book is pretty uh not that well regarded. So um uh, I think it it depends on the crowd you're talking to. I, I think a lot of people really, really like the book, and a lot of people really dislike the book. Um so I don't know. I mean, it was good. It sold enough copies that he wrote. He wrote another one. He wrote Ready yeah, Player that's, Two. That's true. Never read that. I don't know how we started talking about Ready Player One. <laughs> yeah. Well, all the we, One Piece fans are like, "What the fuck?" It was. It was. It hurt you so much to talk about anime in a positive way <laughs> that you had to like. You had you like ran. You ran from it, and you no, took no. you took refuge. See, the, the yeah. most important thing about the One Piece Netflix show is that it's not anime, technically. Right, right. right. So I've broken no rules. I understand. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that is all I had. Um, sorry, I, I just talked forever about two shows you haven't seen, but I thought I thought I, I had to I had to do our, our listeners a solid and, and let them know that I don't hate Ahsoka yeah, uh, or, yeah. or One Piece. I think that's a good service. And now nobody can ask me to watch One Piece anymore because fucking check. Yep. You did it. That's true. You can now say that you watched it whenever anyone Uh asks. Good point. Good point. Have you ever watched One Piece? Yeah. Don't ask me me any more details. Uh, so that's all we had for you folks this week. If you have any opinions on Jacques Tati's playtime on Star Wars Ahsoka or on uh, the shamelessly stolen from Ready Player One One Piece Netflix show, uh, you can reach out to us via email at doofmedia at gmail.com or on Twitter at doofmedia. They're not even that similar, Matt. It's not even I don't even know why this occurred to me. Uh, because you knew it would drive people crazy. That's all. Oh yeah, that's why. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Well, if you're not already subscribed to this podcast, we encourage you to do so and ensure you never miss an episode. You can find us on iTunes, YouTube, Google Play, and pretty much anywhere else podcasts can be found. And if you like what we do here and want to support us, consider becoming a patron of Doof Media. Head on over to patreon.com slash doofmedia and pledge at any of the available levels. And you too can talk about one piece. That's that's right. I don't that's right. know what that has to do with Patreon, but it does. You can't talk about One Piece unless you're a patron of Doof Media. That's correct. Also, please consider rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. Each review helps us get more exposure and introduces new people to the content that we make. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us this week. Next week, um, I don't know. So here's the deal. On our normal recording time, I will be in a hospital with a new baby so there might not be an episode however if matt agrees to go out and watch asteroid city this weekend we can record an episode before i go into the hospital and then there will be an episode so really matt the ball is entirely in your court well to that i say we'll see (laughs) that's the exact kind of commitment that i expected from you matt (laughs) yep (laughs) so next week uh there might not be a new episode we will definitely be taking a break after next week for sure while i am adjusting to life as a a parent of two uh but next week's episode is kind of up in the air still so um if we see you next week great if not we'll see you in a few weeks when i'm back from my 
my parental leave. Uh, one way or another, we'll see you again. And you'll do what I say. Whoop, whoop. My name is Doof, and you'll do what I say. Whoop.